It's my pleasure, although we have never met before, Mary and I, I just got to admit to her that I've been a fan of hers for many years. Um, and this is 100% due to the generosity that she's shown by sharing so much information online, the significant work that she's put into her teaching curriculum, in-person workshops and video tutorials. Um, I've watched all of her appearances on the Roy Underhill's yeah. Woodworth shop and anywhere that I get a chance to listen to her teacher, watch her work, I've just absorbed it and really enjoyed it. Um, I know that today we're gonna get a comprehensive view of Mary's work in her shop and you'll get a good feeling of her teaching style, but I also want to guide you towards something else that I don't want anybody to miss. I'm gonna put a link in the chat to uh, a video that I recommend. Um, successful carving is contingent upon successful sharpening. And there's a YouTube video that was uploaded several years ago by Lost Art Press that illustrates Mary May's simple and effective method for sharpening V gouges. And this video has watch been watched over 108,000 times. And I honestly believe that I can take credit for about one third of those views between myself and my students. V gouges are notoriously one of the trickiest profiles of carving tools to sharpen. And Mary's careful and thoughtful approach has always, it's guided me and many of my students through success many times over. So I'm gonna put that link in the chat. And if her talk today doesn't make you fall in love with wood carving, watch the video and maybe it will just make you fall in love with sharpening so much the better. We, the world needs more sharpeners as well. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being here, Mary. And I, I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Mary May. So glad to have you and thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah, um, I've got a bunch of things on YouTube, some other, some, like, uh, other sharpening um, instructional videos and things like that. So, um, but, um, well, should I just dive in now? Should I start? I'm going to say dive in and dive in. OK, <laughs> there's a couple of questions, but I'll just interject questions as I see them periodically or whenever you point to me at whatever works for you. All right. Well, I've got a lot to go over and um, I'm just going to dive right in um, a little bit about my history. Um, I have been carving almost 30 years now. Um, I started with actually in Minneapolis. Uh, there's a Greek teacher up there, Konstantinos Papadakis. Um, I studied with him for three years and he taught me that very traditional style, the techniques of hand sharpening and, and the uh, that European techniques. Now he apprenticed as the old world apprentice style of, you know, um, seven years of apprenticeship and then seven years of journeyman and then then he was out to uh, pretty much do his thing and um i had the honor of working with him and studying with him and that kind of started me in on this um uh, just the the european style and i had actually been to europe before that and just really kind of fell in love with the cathedrals and the um the interiors and the exteriors of the castles and I was just amazed at all the little intricate details of those, you know, classical European styles. And um, I thought at the time that I was maybe, you know, born two or hundred, two or three hundred years too late, um, thinking it was just one of those things that was back then. And so I was fortunate when I uh, went back to Minneapolis uh, to find Constantinos, and he really started me on the road. And ever since then, I have not looked back, and um, it's I've gone from, you know, doing a lot of uh, commission work to teaching at various locations um, on my uh, on my. Uh, video, or, sorry, ugh, on my website, I've got the list of in-person classes this year. Last year, there weren't that many in-person classes, as uh, everybody <laughs> knows and realizes that wasn't happening in 2020. So they are opening up again, and so I'm scheduled to teach about once a month, various places throughout the U.S., um, and I have an online school, started an online school, which is all video-based. And there's about six hours of free videos, and this will get you through the sharpening, uh, as Paul had said. Um, that that lesson on sharpening, um, very similar. Um, a couple um, beginner projects, just some simple carving projects. So please look look at that. 
um, sign up as a free member and a lot of it, it will, what it'll do, it'll give you a sense um, of kind of testing it out and seeing if this is something for you. It's a little different than um, whittling and using, you know, holding something in your hand and using a knife. Um, this is all clamped down onto the bench. Um, lo the long handled um, uh, carving gouges. And so I'm going to be showing you a demonstration. I'm going to be talking to you about the um, what tools I use, talk about how I work. Um, and it's actually, it's a very safe way of carving because in general, um, all tool blades, anything sharp is away from your body. Now I have to say this because I don't know if you look up close at that. I've got band aids all over my fingers, so <laughs> this is this is just something that has nothing to do with carving. <laughs> I've got a story for every band aid, and it just happened to be the last week. I just seem to be wounding myself. Nothing to do with sharp tools, though. Just as so you know, <laughs> disclaimer. Um, but. Um, so uh, I also recently, well, three, it's about three years ago, I finished my first book, Carving the Acanthus Leaf, 320 pages of how to carve this very traditional leaf. And um, it's a, a fascinating um, journey about um, a lot of, it's almost like, a, like an autobiography because there's stories along with it. And, um, but it's a very methodical step-by-step -step process of how to carve 13 different designs, you know, French Rococo, Baroque, um, Greek, anyway. So um, that is available through Lost Art Press. That's lostartpress.com. And it's very exciting. And honestly, I could probably write an entire additional book, <laughs> volume two, and still not run out of different types of acanthus leaves. Now, I just wanted to really quickly, the acanthus leaf, a lot of people have never heard the word before. Even students of mine have never heard the word. It is that very traditional leaf that is seen everywhere in Corinthian capitals. And it's that, I just call it, it's that swirling leaf that you see in all sorts of antique uh, furniture design. Anyway, it's that swirly, <laughs> swirly leaf. <laughs> So, all right, I'm going to uh, shift over to some close-up cameras. I'm going to get going on some um, demonstrations on my carving. So bear with me. I'm going to share screen. And I've got to do, oops. All right. So just want to make sure all that is working. Is that, um, everything's good? All right, just want to make sure because it's a little difficult to tell what's what's visible. Okay, um, so yes, yeah, so uh, just want to, <laughs> yeah, there's a disclaimer. See my lovely band-aids that are just, uh, yeah, they're, I tried to make them skin color, but you know, no, that's, I, I burned myself there and then um, had an issue with the ring that I actually had to cut off my, my wedding ring <laughs> this week. I actually had to snip it off because it was causing issues. So just so you know, not carving tools. Um, all right, I just wanted to go over just some um, some basics of getting started, some of the equipment you might use. Um, what I do, and this is funny because I have cuts all over my hand, um, but generally, as I said, when you're using the long handle gouges, you usually don't have to worry about getting cut because they're always held like this, whether it's right or left hand. It's always held like that, but, and this is always pointing away from you, all right? The blade is, is never, should never come towards you like that. And it, it, this also should never be carved with one hand, okay? Always with two hands. So there's very, very few times when I actually cut myself. The only time I do cut myself is when I pack up my tools and my tool roll and, you know, maybe bump the, the end of them. Um, but generally carving, that doesn't happen. Um, now, uh, you can wear gloves carving, but a lot of times I use the fingerless gloves, uh, like bicycle or weightlifting gloves. And a lot of times they have padding on the, the pad or right over along this side. And because the only reason I really wear gloves is because this side of my hand gets worn rubbing along the tool uh, or rubbing along the wood itself, the surface. And so, um, you know, go like this, and I have this part of my hand touching as, as a base or a brace, all right, somewhere, 
And as a result, sometimes this part of your hand really goes up along sharp edges of the wood. And I can cut myself, especially when you're using hard woods like walnut or oak or something like that. And you get uh, actually cuts along the hand. So fingerless biking bicycle gloves are what I use for that. It doesn't necessarily stop um, or prevent uh, stab <laughs> cuts. So be careful with that. Um, if you're really concerned and if you have a tendency to point the tool towards yourself, I wouldn't recommend it. But if you do, they've got Kevlar gloves that um, uh, you can wear and they actually protect more from slicing cuts if you're really uh, concerned about that. But I'm looking at the screener and that does not look good with those band-aids there. <laughs> uh, just, just so you know, it's not done by carving tools. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, and another tool that I use quite often are mallets. And here's a couple of different varieties. I love mallets, <clears throat> my, my uh, sample. Um, so this is typically what you would find. Um, this is a lignum vitae one. It's quite dense and really solid. This is a lovely handmade one that a friend of mine made. And then there's this little steel and brass mallets. They all work fine. They're just slightly different weights. Um, quite often when you make, um, when you have something turned in just regular wood, it's not quite heavy enough. Um, so you might have to um, maybe drill a hole in the bottom and maybe add some something lead or some weighted epoxy or something to, to add a little bit of weight to it because the weight that I like for the mallets is between a pound and a pound and a half. And it just ends up being a really comfortable weight. Um, less than a pound, you're actually having to use a lot of effort to actually do the job of the mallet. And more than a pound and a half seems to be just a little too hefty. Now it depends on how strong you are. Uh, it depends on how often you're gonna be using it. And so uh, what I like about these little, um, the metal mallets is I can actually hold onto it like this and I can do, you know, light tapping like that. I do a lot of that very light tapping and I actually hold on to the head of the mallet. Um, unfortunately, you can't really do that as what that. <laughs> the roll things around. <laughs> this, uh, do you see how um, it's a little hard to do that? And you can really, this is more for just, you know, hogging out big chunks of um, big chunks of wood and you, by holding on to by the handle. All right, so um, <clears throat> let me pick up the things that I'm throwing around. <clears throat> so yeah, a mallet, um, I don't use them all the time, but um, as I said, that little light tapping actually is a good controlling um, cut or a controlling method. It actually causes, helps you to sort of move it along a very controlled, um, controlled cut. So um, let me just see here. Um, a good starting wood, let me just show you some of these, some of the different types of wood that you can have. Um, this is basswood and this is butternut. Now um, those I think are probably the two most common starting woods. Um, they're both relatively soft. This, the butternut is actually called white walnut. And um, so it is in the walnut family. Uh, unfortunately, I think there is something happening, um, like a, a canker um, fungus or something uh, that is uh, sadly killing the butternut trees. And uh, so um, what you find now for the butternut, and I know I, when I was living in Minnesota, I uh, carved a lot in butternut, so I know there were a lot of trees up there. Um, but I think probably what you find now are either trees that have fallen and they're just uh, using the wood from fallen trees. I just don't know if it's if they're coming back, but it's what it is, it's beautiful. Um, you can look on the back. The grain itself is really beautiful and you can make it look like oak or dark walnut. You can uh, stain it and make it look like a lot of different woods. And the basswood, which is really the one I use mainly for starting, uh, this, you can see it's very, very light, <clears throat> um, very light colored, hardly any green visible. Um, now I do wanna point out, if you are gonna be 
there's different types of basswood. There's a southern basswood and then there's northern basswood. I would really recommend that you use northern basswood. Um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, New York, uh, you want to make sure that the winters are really solid because it's, it, it is a completely different type of wood from the ones that you find in Georgia, Tennessee. Okay, so uh, sometimes you may not be able to know where they're coming from, where the wood comes from, but if you can see a real distinct grain line, that's probably southern basswood. Um, let me just show you with this one here. This, this is actually something I get from uh, Wisconsin and you can barely see the grain on that. And it just, uh, for starting out carving, it really is uh, a good one to begin with because it's relatively soft and the grain doesn't, doesn't fight with you too much. Okay, and then as you go on a little bit more advanced, this is uh, black walnut. And let's see, where's another one? This, this is um, mahogany. All right, and just, um, I get some really beautiful, these are just the next steps really if you wanted to move past the basswood and butternut. Just takes a lot more effort, physical effort, and a little bit more control of the tools. And, um, but they're really beautiful. Uh, the, I think what happens is when you start working in the harder woods, the finishing ends up being so much more beautiful. Um, if you are ever going to paint any of your carvings, I would recommend doing it on the basswood, again, because it's not such an interesting um, grain pattern. So if you're ever gonna paint it, I would do it with the, the basswood. Um, okay, so if you take a look at what I've got here, this is just a standard workbench. Um, you can use bench dogs in here. And this is really, it's really ideal. Um, you can come and use the bench dogs in there, all right, and hold whatever you want in there, all right. And um, it holds it, it's very sturdy, um, and it's safe, and, and these really aren't in the way of the carving. <clears throat> so that's one way. If you don't, though, if you don't have this nice workbench, um, there's a, a lot of things you could do, and one of the things is you just wanted to work on your kitchen table, let's say, just get a backer board. Oh, yeah, that, I've obviously used that a lot. This is just a piece of plywood. And let's just say, let's just say I wanted to carve this. Um, and uh, the thing about this is it's kind of an odd shaped carving. And this was actually, the wood blank was actually cut out on a scroll saw or band saw. And then it was attached to this backer board. And then I carved it. And then it's completely free of clamps or anything like that. So I attach it to the backer board with double sided tape. And I use golf grip tape. And this is really handy. If you are a golfer, you probably know what this is, but you just wrap it around a golf handle and then you slide the golf, um, the golf handle onto it. It, it holds it tight and then you use a solvent to release it. And now I, I am not a golfer, so I don't know how often you change handles. <laughs> so obviously it seems like something that you change often because um, it's important to be able to release it. Now, the reason I like this is so what you do is you just take it on, stick it on there. Here, I'll show you real, real quickly. So basically you just go like that. And take that off. You really wanna do a little bit more than that so it holds solid. And then stick it down, right? And that holds it very tightly. And um, so I can clamp this, right? Clamp, clamp this down. You can do it on a kitchen table completely clear of any clamps and it holds it tightly. And then when you're finished, you take a flat chisel and lift it up and you can just take it and just do a little bit of a twist of the flat chisel. Or if it's too tight and it really holds and if you've got a really fragile carving, then what you do is you take a solvent around the outside edge. Uh, for this particular type of kind of tape, it's lacquer thinner and you brush it along and it is amazing. It's just a very, very gentle lifting this up and it releases. 
what it does, it soaks into the tape and it does that, uh, it releases the tape. Um, and so I'll take this flat chisel, just take it down like that, and then just do a little bit of a twisting and it releases it. So with this method, you can pretty much carve anywhere. You can carve on a picnic table, you can carve on you know, your kitchen table, your countertops, but um, it allows you to do some pretty delicate pieces, um, you know, pre-cut out pieces and not have any clamps near there. Now the thing is, even if you're doing something like this that is going to be carved into a board, you can do the same thing there. Stick the double-sided tape on the back of that, hold it down, and then clamp this again so the clamps don't have to be really crowding you. Okay, very, very handy um, method if you don't have um, if you don't have the, the clamps or anything like that or, or a workbench. Okay, now the height that I um, like my workbenches because I tend to stand and when I stand um, the reason I stand is because I can really get a lot of leverage I can get a lot of movement um, I do a lot of leaning into my work and actually leaning over the work and pressing in that way and so uh, now if you're unable to stand you know if you have a bad back or bad knees um, you certainly can take a, a stool and sit on that. The difference is, though, that you're just going to be using different muscles. You're going to be pushing more um, with your muscles rather than leaning into it. So you can certainly do that. It's just a different method and, and different muscles. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm covering everything. Okay, let's start talking about tools. And um, I'm going to show you what... I've got here. So I'll just grab a few sample ones. There's a few. So I'll grab one more. Okay, so we've got a couple different examples um, of this little center there, so you can see. Let me get this out of here. There we go. Much better. Okay, so just um, walking through. Now, this is actually my favorite kind of tool. It's a fishtail. And these are about between 9 and 11 inches long. And now I have relatively large hands, um, but it's a very comfortable fit as I move right from there to there and, you know, just to uh, hold it comfortable without a lot of overlapping of my hands or anything like that. The sort of mid-size ones that are more like about that long, um, a lot of times you have to overlap your hands and the palm gouges, the really short, sm small ones, which I actually don't even know if I have any, you know, more like this one here, like this one. Um, there's a tendency though to use that as with one hand and that's really what they're made for, but it's also much more dangerous because there's a tendency to have your other hand on the other side of the blade. Uh, so um, that's why I kind of stay away from those. Okay, so the fishtail, uh, those are really my preferred. They splay out and um, they it ends up almost being more like a skew chisel uh, by reaching into corners and it's a little thinner here uh, just so when you're using it, it's not very bulky compared to this, which is pretty much straight all the way. All right, a little bit bulkier, um, not uh, as, as delicate of a corner. This is really what you'd be using more for sculpture, you know, removing a lot of wood. And then we've got this, which is a long bent. See the shape of that, a very gentle curve. I have to say, I have never used this tool ever. <laughs> it's here, <laughs> I have it to show what it is, and I never use the long bent ones. Um, what it does as, as you're carving it, it, it kind of forces you to lift it off the wood a little bit higher, and it's a little bit more awkward to use. And uh, to be honest, I guess you just get used to what you start with. And so I've never really had any use for this. This would be helpful if you're trying to get into some deep, sort of deep, uh, like a deep bowl or something like that. That would be helpful to reach into areas that for this one might end up kind of catching and get, getting caught on the edge. So it just allows you to get into a deeper 
area. Now this is something similar, but it's, it's called a spoon bend, but it's similar in that it's a much more aggressive curve. I probably use this more than, um, no, uh, definitely more than this one because <laughs> I never use that one. Uh, but if you have some really awkward areas, a lot of times the shells, if you're doing the concave part of the shell, this is helpful. Um, and again, I very rarely use this uh, for relief carving, but it's there and it's very helpful when you do need it. This is called a back bent gouge. And you can see that it's similar shape in this way to, um, to the uh, spoon bent, but if you look at the blade, it's a reversed blade. I don't know if you can see that. So this is curved this way, and this is hollow, all right? So, and you, if you take a look at that, the bevel is actually on the top there, and it's on the bottom there, all right? So this is, allows you to make cuts, uh, lifts uh, off, off the wood a little bit, and allows you to make convex cuts. All right. Again, I probably have used this particular tool about three times. <laughs> so, uh, again, they, they're more like museum pieces. <laughs> okay. Um, talking about, let's see, some of the brands. Um, Swiss Made is probably the main one that you, uh, it's also called File, P F E I L. And that's probably the, um, the most common that you actually be able to uh, go into a store and find. Um, and so there's Dastra. That's the original ones that I started out with. Uh, unfortunately, I believe the last year they closed down and another German company, I believe Hirsch, H-I-R-S-C-H, uh, bought out Dastra. So very sad, about 180 year old company um, closed down. Um, all right, there's Austrian Stubai. That's another one. Uh, what else do I have? I'm just trying to gra grab samples of these. Um, two cherries. That's another one. Uh, that's a German one. There's Henry Taylor, which is English. And I just want to make sure I haven't forgotten any. Um, just um, There's Ariu, which is French, and that is This one, a really very, very sweet little um, fishtail. Um, the RU, I believe, um, Lee Nielsen sells those. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm afraid some of these, um, there's an issue with stock this year. Um, I don't know if they were able to do a lot of manufacturing last year, so there's having issues with stock, but Lee Nielsen has the RU or, or used to, and I think Highland Woodworking also. Um, and that's a, that's a French brand. It's a more recent one. And let's see, we've got Dastra, which I mentioned, that's this one. And the file Swiss made, again, this is where you could probably uh, walk into and actually look at them. Uh, Woodcraft supply stores, also um, chippingaway.com. Uh, they actually have um, sets, Mary May sets um, that I, sort of my preferred set. Um, and let's see, Stubai, Two Cherry, Henry Taylor, and Addis. Addis is the um, vintage, the vintage um, tools. Let me see if I can find one of those. I've got some. All right, well, there's, so if you can find some of the old English tools uh, that generally they are of the Addis family. There was three generations of Addis family that, um, made and sold tools. And that's usually the, the most common that you'll see. Okay, wanted to talk about the, um, this is basically a starter set. Um, just actually, you know what, hold on, reverse. I'll show you that in a minute. I wanna talk about how these are numbered first before I go over that, because that's gonna really get confusing. So let me just walk you through this. So this is, let me get a piece of paper there with me. I want to talk to you about how the tools are identified. And 
So let's just start out with a, a number one, which is a flat chisel, right? So there's two numbers. Let's just look at this. This is easiest. This, the Swiss made is great because they actually label them very large on the handles. So there's two numbers. The first number represents the curvature or sweep, and the second number represents the width in millimeters. And that's basically as if you're taking a straight line across there and measuring from corner to corner. So we've got number one, which is a flat, and number two, which is slightly curved. There's only one exception, some of the German tools, the number two is a skew flat chisel, right? Just to confuse things. All right, so, but generally most of the, most of the number twos are just a slight curve to it. Then as the numbers increase, the curvature increases, all right? And we're talking about that first number, the number seven, right, on this particular one. So this goes all the way up, all the way to a number 11, which is a U shape. And that's also referred to as a veiner. The really tiny ones are called veiners and the larger ones are called fluters. So the tiny ones, this is more like a U shape, the tiny ones carve the vein details and the larger ones carve flutes, thus a veiner and a fluter. <laughs> so, um, so that's basically it. So let me just grab a, here is one that is a number five, eight. All right, so this is nine, or sorry, five F, which means a fishtail, right? So it lays out a little bit. So it's a five curvature and eight millimeters wide. All right, and just another one. Here's a number seven curvature and a 14 millimeters. So seven curvature and 14 millimeters wide. Now, a lot of times they're just stamped on the metal itself, so it's not real obvious. You have to kind of look for them. Um, all right, are there any questions that have come up? I mean, I can take some time. I'm kind of at a point. There, this is a great time. There was a question about handle styles, and I think this is a super time for you to maybe address the different handles that we saw on the tools you were showing us. Um, sure, let's grab those. Um, Basically, a lot of the ones, um, yeah, most of them are octagonal, all right? And that's, um, for several reasons, they're good to grip, all right? And they also don't roll off the bench. <laughs> um, I do have some antique ones that are round, and um, they do, they like to roll. Uh, let's see if I can find some other ones here. Some of the, yeah, some of the older ones tend to be round. All right, so here's some, this is an antique um, antique one. The handle's round, all right, that one's, it's got sort of an interesting little nubby custom <laughs> end on that. Um, but in general, what you find now are the, the octagonal handles, and that's really, that it grips well, um, and it's interesting too, these larger handles, that's much larger than these other ones, but they, Typically, um, the octagonal handles are just, they don't roll and um, they are quite good to grip as a result of that too. You can kind of brace your thumb on the flat side and um, it doesn't, doesn't slip. So I hope that answered that question. Well, one other quick one I'll throw. Going back a little bit, you were talking about mallets earlier yes. on and we had a question about why typically you see carvers using round mallets as opposed to, I know a lot of like a joiners would use a square wooden mallet. What, what, how, what's your answer to that? Um, my answer to that is I don't have to look at where it's hitting. At this point, you don't have to aim it, right? So you just have to make sure it contacts it, but you don't have to necessarily um, aim or position this in any way at all. It's just, it's, it's as long as it's hitting it. Um, in fact, I do have a square one and I got, I used it for a little while and I realized why that I liked the round ones because I had to really focus on positioning it in a particular angle and making sure it hit dead on. And this way, doesn't matter. 
as long as it hits. So um, yeah, good question because um, uh, that does make make a lot of sense. And and the same the same thing. I do stone carving also, and it's um, there's a uh, they use the the round ones too. So you want to concentrate on what's happening with the blade. And what you want to look at that rather than pay attention to what's happening back here. Okay. If I can jump in with one more, Mary, uh, you talked about benches quickly before, and we had a question about bench height. How yes. do you determine the best bench height for yourself or for your students? Yes, I actually had meant to include that in there and I must have slipped out. So sorry about that. Um, but bench height is um, about elbow height or maybe an inch or two below elbow height. Okay, now this is a standard workbench. I actually have had to raise this up six inches because normal standard workbench is quite low for carving and that can really get bad on your back and shoulders. So yeah, great question. And I apologize for missing that one, but that was, that's a biggie because um, that's why I recommend like, if you're gonna be working in your kitchen, which a lot of people do, I, I started that way. <laughs> um, the countertops are a little bit better than tabletops because you're gonna be leaning over so far to get down and reach the carving. Um, if you don't have it raised up or to a more comfortable height. But uh, yeah, um, so I'd say if you stand like this, basically try to, um, you know, move your, at the, at the elbow height, that or an inch or two below. And it, you know, then you can kind of customize it too to see what feels good for you. If your back starts hurting a little bit more, um, you know, adjust it. If your shoulders hurt, actually, if you're, if you're having to raise up like that, that means it's too high. If you're having to sort of like, feel like you're climbing on top, then it's actually too high because you're actually having to lift your shoulders. So I've, I've found about that inch or two below elbow. Anything else? I think we're in good shape. The last question is related to sharpening. And if, if, if you get into that content, I was gonna wait to see if you touched on that later. If not, I'll throw it in at the end. Well, what time are we looking at? Oh, I'm gonna get into some carving. So um, I will, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm gonna have time to get into sharpening, but I can certainly go over, after I do a demonstration here, I wanna, I, I can walk you through the process. I'm not sure if you'll be able to do the whole process because it can get kind of long-winded. Um, and our question um, was, um, what, 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 having trouble uh, deciding whether or not a chisel is still perfectly sharp, when is it time to sharpen? Maybe that will kind of integrate with the work you're doing right now. Um, yeah, I mean, really, generally the question with that is if, it, um, the nice thing about tools now, when you buy them, usually they are very, very sharp. So you, when you start carving, you pretty much have a good concept of what a sharp tool feels like. And then as you work through it, you can start feeling it. If you start seeing like little um, scratch marks across the surface and you can start feeling that it's just having a little bit more effort to get the, the um, tool through the wood. Um, and and honestly, that ends up being more of a understanding the tools, having carved enough and understanding what to expect from them. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things like that ends up being just having tools in your hand, carving enough so you know what to expect. Um, but as I said, when you people start now because you buy brand new tools and they are razor sharp when you bring them, bring them home. So you know what a, a sharp tool should be if you can get the, the really sharp tools to start. Um, and then you can just sort of feel when it starts to change um, and get a little bit more of a struggle. So I will, um, I'll get, uh, hopefully we'll be able to go over a little bit of the sharpening. But I would encourage you, if we don't go through a lot of that, um, be able to get to that, I would encourage you to either go onto the, the um, YouTube channel, or YouTube for that, or go on to the online school and I go through pretty much the whole process of sharpening the V chisel and sharpening a curved gouge. Okay, so what I've got here, uh, is there any questions or should I go on? No, go right ahead. We're all caught up for questions. All right. 
Okay, so um, what I've done here, I'm just gonna do a very shallow relief carving. And this is basically what I'm gonna be doing. Um, this is something I put a finish on it and kind of antique. There's actually a, a line right there where I was doing two different finish techniques. Um, but this is basically what I'm going to be showing you how to do. Very shallow relief, no more than a quarter of an inch deep. And um, so there's this technique. Hold on. So there's this, which is shallow relief. All right. And it's kind of carved into I actually lower down the outside. And this is actually the original surface, right? So if you look sideways, that is really very, very shallow. Then there's this one, which is called more of an applique that you cut out with a bandsaw and then carve it and much thicker. You can jump right into actually doing all the details and you can use the full thickness of the wood. But this is actually a lot nicer if you don't have bandsaw or scroll saw and you just wanted to dive right into carving into the surface. Just get a square block of wood, transfer the template. And what I use is just carbon paper. You can get this off of supply stores. You can also use transfer paper that is, or uh, graphite paper that you can get at uh, hobby stores or craft stores. All right, and <laughs> I always say this to my students because there's always one. Make sure the dark side is pointed down against the wood. If you do it this way, <laughs> you're gonna get this lovely duplicate <laughs> drawing on the back side of your uh, paper. And uh, I just, I have to say that because there's always one in a class. <laughs> All right, so I've got that transferred on. And so what I'm gonna do first, I'm gonna take my V chisel and I'm gonna outline that. And what that's going to do is it's going to start me to um, lower down the background so that it's going to give me a, a good um, a good backgrounding, right? a good outline of that. Just take my V chisel and if you take a look at this, you can see it's shaped like a V. And I'm just going around the outline and I'm not touching the carving at all. All right, I'm just taking, leaving that line visible, just going on the outside. And if you see already, I've gone back and forth and switching right and left hand. So I would really encourage you to, um, as you start carving, to really get the handle of um, switching from your right and left hand um, because as you're moving the grain direction and just approaching it, the easiest way to approach it, um, it makes a huge difference. And so I would encourage you right when you start to just start <laughs> putting it in that hand that you're not comfortable with. Now I am very, very right-handed um, with anything else. I cannot do anything with my left hand, but because um, I've pretty much gone, gotten past that and worked with my left and right hand enough, uh, usually what happens in a class is after the first day of class, it is pretty much um, equal, equal comfort of um, right and left hand. And it's surprising. And, you know, if you've never um, carved before, it's sometimes a little bit easier to kind of get past that awkwardness if you're just starting out. And when you look at this, I mean, basically, when I'm doing this, I'm still, whether it's left or right hand, both hands are doing a lot. So what I'm doing here, notice I've got this, here, let me show you, I've got this sort of hard callus right there. <laughs> and that's from uh, doing many years of holding this, uh, holding against the uh, wood and bracing it. And coming along. And so he's, what I've got in my hand right here is a number 714. And what I'm doing is just lowering down the background. Now watch what I'm doing as I'm doing this close up or a um, little bit more of a slower, but if, can you see there's a slight twisting to it? It's a slight rotation and that actually helps it get through 
um, the wood. Now the grain on this one is going like this, all right? And so right along this side, I'm actually going across the grain. <laughs> all right, now that question about the, um, when a tool is getting dull, <laughs> as I'm going across the grain, this is just on the edge of not quite cooperating with me. And I don't know if you can see the detail on that, but it's just kind of doing a little bit of kind of catching the wood. So fortunately, I've got some extras sitting around. So I'm gonna grab another number seven and see if this one works a little bit better. Oh, much better. You can actually hear the difference. Okay, so to, to continue with answering that one question, you can actually hear <laughs> Learn how to hear the grain talking to you. Okay, so yes, much better. So this is a 714. It's got enough of a curve to make these cuts and not let the corners of the tool go under the wood. So I'm just doing a very slight twisting and that twisting motion really helps it get through the wood and it also helps control it. It's kind of like slicing a loaf of bread. You know, you wanna do a slicing motion rather than just pressing in. All right, now while I'm still on this side, I'm gonna take my V-chisel again and just do a final little cleanup. And I'm going to turn it around so I can access it. Now, if you're ever tempted to take and cut towards yourself, I really, really would advise you to turn the wood around. So like right here, I could come in here like that and cut towards myself that way. But first of all, it's a very awkward cut um, because I really don't get much leverage. And it's very dangerous because if I, if it's not controlled, you could slip past it and not a very pretty sight. So in this direction, turn it around. And this is what's nice about using these bench dogs is they're very easy to just uh, clamp and reclamp. So being impatient, now I wanna go get to the carving of it. So I'm just gonna run through this one quickly. Right, and again, this is kind of a shortcut method of getting the carving to be revealed from the background. Now you could end up taking the whole background down flat, but that's a completely different process and a much longer process. I call that the human router. All right, and then just take the V-chisel and do the final cleanup there. All right, so then um, once I get this down and try to get all the edges down, Okay, so it's a little, little rough, but that's the idea. Now I'm going to go in and start to uh, detail this. Let me just give me a minute. I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer. Let's do a different angle here. All right, bear with me while I do some adjusting on this. And zoom in. We can really get some detail shots. And right here. Oops, other way. Ah, too much. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> gonna get you dizzy. <laughs> Oops, Just trying to get it focused. Nope, not there. 
Okay, so let's just see. So from here, now what I wanna do first of all is identify any overlapping. Now this is gonna be very shallow. As I said, quarter of an inch. So I'm gonna take my V chisel and divide off the flower from the leaf. All right, and then I can take this whole area and just lower that down so that it looks like that leaf is going underneath. So that's pretty much on these shallow relief carvings, that's pretty much what I do first. I find any parts that look uh, or should appear to go over the other. All right, and then on this part here, do you see how this kind of curls around? And here, I'll show you on the, um, on the deep one. You see how this um, is the other side or the far side of the flower. And then we've got this as sort of the edge of the flower. And this is the outer edge completely, All right? So this is obviously a much deeper one, but I'm gonna give the illusion that this is doing the same thing. So I'm gonna take my V chisel and I'm just gonna outline some of these areas. All right, and then I'm also gonna outline this one because there's just sort of identifying the edges. Okay, now I can take this part and make it look like it's going underneath that little edge. And then, so this kind of tapers, all right? But basically, this is gonna be the same height from here to there, to there, to there. All of that is gonna be the same height, but I'm gonna give the illusion that it's not, all right? So I can basically take advantage of this very, very shallow carving but trick the eye into thinking that it's a lot deeper than it actually is. So what I've got here, I'm using a number 314 and just taking and rounding over the outer edges. And so similar to like a, a very shallow relief carving of a coin, you just roll over the outer edges and this, so this is relatively flat along the, uh, along the center area, but if you round over the outer edges, pretty aggressive rounding, it's gonna give the illusion that it is a lot deeper. All right, and then take this one, take this, and go. So that's gonna tuck under there. I'll give the illusion, I should say, of tucking under. So a lot of this very shallow relief carving is more optical illusion than anything. All right, I'm just gonna go with my beaches and do a little more cleanup. And then this outer edge is also going to be rounded because that should basically is the opposite side of this. Now let me just do that, see if it shows up a little bit better. And then this is just going to round over. Okay, so that's curling back. And then this should be the outer edge of the flower. So this side then should be the rounded side. So it looks like it's curling on the inside. And if you wanted to really accentuate this, you make a really hard edge there and actually do a little bit of an undercut right there so it looks like it curls all the way back. And I'm just gonna take this along the edge there because I don't like seeing that line, a little distracting. So really I'm just kind of shaving off that surface. And a little bit of a curl there. 
Okay, um, and now what I'm gonna do is take a vein line there, finish up there, maybe a few little veins there. And actually, I don't want to have any of that original surface because it really makes a quite a transition between the carved surface and the, that plain surface. So I'm just gonna go along there just to break it up a little bit. And then I'm gonna take this V chisel and make a vein line there. Okay, and that is pretty much it. Let's just get rid of some of the other cleanup. So in it, now if you wanted to um, detail this a little bit more, that was really <laughs> kind of quick and <laughs> a, little, a little rough. Um, but um, you can see if you hold it up, um, you can see this is relatively flat right there, but it gives the illusion by having an aggressive round there, an aggressive rounding there, it gives the illusion. But if you look at it from the side, it doesn't make any sense at all. Look at it straight on. It uh, you know, gives the, your eye sees that curve there and it recognizes this as a flower and your brain fills in all the blanks. So anyway, that was a, <coughs> a very quick run through <laughs> of a very shallow relief carving project. Um, are there any questions? Mary, there's one last question I'm gonna ask as we, as we kind of wrap up here. I'm so yeah. glad that I wasn't forced to interrupt you and I would have received 95 pieces of hate mail for uh, stopping you from your work there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> It's, it's been, I, I, this has just been such a joy to watch and I'm sure for everyone involved. Um, there, there was a question about sourcing your wood and what your favorite sources are, maybe perhaps how you guide your students too. And that I'd love to hear some ideas. I bet a lot of people would like to hear what you say about that. Sure, um, how about if I stop the share and I'll just go back and so. Is that, am I, did I just stop share? <laughs> am I back? <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, well, um, as I said, the, uh, the um, basswood itself, it really does need to be that Northern basswood. Um, I get mine from Northern Wisconsin. Um, uh, there's a couple places, Heineke Woodworks. Uh, there's um, Wilcox Woodworking up in Northern Wisconsin. Uh, you really, uh, you could find it in um, uh, woodcraft supply stores. Uh, the difficulty is if you go to just a, a Lowe's and try to find any kind of carving wood, you're just going to get frustrated because they've got poplar and they've got pine, but I wouldn't carve in either one of those. Um, they're just, uh, I, it's funny, uh, poplar is one of those things that uh, I think people think is going to be a wood, good wood carving wood because it's soft but it really is kind of a nightmare. <laughs> so if you can compare side by side, basswood and, um, and poplar, it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a different world. So, um, but yeah, sourcing is actually a hard thing to do because a lot of the times now you have to go online to get it and you don't get to look at it. So if you can walk into any store, whether it's um, you know, a, a lumber supply company that specializes in lumber, um, hardwoods, a lot of times they do supply basswood along with it. It tends to be more for, for hobbyists really. So you kind of have to source that out. Um, if you have an opportunity to go to any kind of wood carving show, I'm hoping they're going to be coming back. Um, usually there's somebody there that supplies basswood and sometimes butternut. I'm not quite sure about that these days, but there's always somebody setting up a booth um, selling pieces of basswood. So they have those shows all over the place, a lot of times at malls. Um, but that's also a good place. Um, another place which seems to be um, a little bit more available these days is go to um, a hobby store like Michael's and you go in um, and into the woodworking section and you can find usually 
uh, basswood. Let me just, one second, I'll grab one of those pieces because I do use it. So I do use this because it really locally, it's about the only place I can find it. And you get the, the live edge board, um, which is interesting, you know, uh, gives a little character to the carving. So they come in all different sizes. Sometimes it's not very good quality. That's what I'm a little concerned about a lot of times. Um, this is also what you find in basswood sometimes. It's glued up. Um, but if you look at that, you can actually see the grain on that. So I'm guessing that's probably southern basswood. That's the type of thing that would show up, almost like pine. Um, <clears throat> but it's considered basswood and it does carve okay. Um, but anyway, that's, that's actually a really good place if you just wanna walk into a store and find some. So does that help? <laughs> That's fantastic. Mary, thank you so much. We promise to be respectful of your time. And I know that a lot of us would love to sit and listen to and to be able to see more. But uh, thank you so much for inviting us into your studio and giving us a little taste of, of your work and your techniques. And, and I know that's going to inspire a lot of people to kind of look further and, and to get hopefully try it out. We can't wait for the time when we're able to have you come to North House Folk School too. So we'll really thank look you. forward to that. Well, thank, thank you, you very you. much. I, I enjoyed it. I could go on forever, but I know oh. some people have to stop. <laughs> well, All right, well, thank you. Thank you again, and thanks to everyone who's attended. This has been a has been a great event. We appreciate all the questions, and if your questions didn't get answered, I'm sorry about that. But um, yeah, this has been super fun, and we really appreciate everybody being here. I bet Jess has got some. I was just going to pop in and say thanks to Mary, um, and let folks know we are scheming to bring Mary to campus in 2022. So. Please uh, keep an eye on the e-news while we figure that out. Um, I hope folks can join us next Thursday in the, at um, six o'clock in the evening with Curtis Buchanan, and then again on Friday with Barn the Spoon at noon. Um, really a pleasure to have you, Mary. We will post a recording of this webinar on our website here in um, hope maybe this afternoon, but more likely on Monday. So. It'll be there quickly, and we'll look forward to seeing uh, seeing you soon, Mary. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, guys.